And welcome in to Pressbox Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Pressbox and PressboxOnline.com. As he is every Wednesday night, or just about every Wednesday night, Gary Stein joins me. Gary, how are you, my friend? Smooth sailing from here, Stanley. All right. Wait a minute. I've lost my picture. There we go. And oh, joining us, God. it's always a fun time when we get together with the two smartest guys in any sports business room. <laughs> and we have with us longtime executive in four different sports, and he'll invent a fifth one to become an executive of that as well. That is Andy Dolich on the left coast. How are you, Andy? I'm great, Gary, Stan, and Marty. And Marty is uh, showing that he is really intelligent with the college sweatshirt. <laughs> yes, I'm just wearing gray, but you know, I could have worn my American University sweatshirt <laughs> if I had one. If I well, had that, one. Marty, that would have been a nice... A nice Marty is here. showing that he's smart because he's paying tribute to the people that pay his check these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. He's a professor over at Georgetown University in the area of sports business. So, guys, we've got. A well, let's, you know, OK, so <laughs> I do some teaching <laughs> over here if we're going to go on. Stanford. The Stanford. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Touche. Touche. Yes. yes. Yep. Touché. 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 You get a paycheck for that, Andy? I want to make sure. <laughs> I do, actually. Uh, uh, Ellen, my wife, takes 101% of it, but I do. Get paid. <laughs> All right. Hey, we got a lot to field uh, in the world of sports today. It was interesting. I just woke, I woke, when I woke up, I didn't just wake up, uh, but I woke up and hit the ESPN. I said, what are we going to talk about tonight? And there's this monster deal uh, that, the Staples Center, a longtime staple uh, for the Los Angeles uh, Lakers. Now the LA Clippers play there. And also, didn't the Kings play there for a long time, Marty? Uh, I don't know if they, uh, they may have. They yeah. may have. Uh, yeah, yeah, they did because there was three teams at one the time. Great Bruce McNall Bruce before he went to right. jail, right? That's yeah. right. But, it, but yeah. it's always been, as, as far as I know, it's always been the Staples Center. That's Come right. this December, it's going to be crypto.com for a record $700 million deal. Is that for 20 years, I believe, Marty? Yeah, 20 years is what they've talked about. Uh, so, how are they going to pay it? In yeah, Bitcoin. I, uh, they'll in be, Bitcoin. I was going to say they'll Bitcoin. probably take, they'll, they'll take it any way they can, but uh, they'll <laughs> take it in, in, in crypto. But just think about that, a, a 20-year deal for a uh, cryptocurrency company. I mean, wh where was cryptocurrency 20 years ago? Where do you think it'll be 20 years from now? We don't know. So um, just like any other deal, I suspect there'll be some twists and turns along the way. Well, I you put Gary, all your Ethereum in a, a tomato can and bury it in your backyard? <laughs> yeah, you exactly. This, uh, Bitcoin, exactly. I'm well, yeah. well, Gary remembers, and I do too, when the Ravens' new stadium mm -hmm. went from, I think it was the first one or two years, Gary, it was Ravens Stadium. Yeah. And then they got this big internet concern. Marty, you remember PSI yeah. Net. Exactly. Got PSI Net Stadium. Yep. And uh, I'd say about three years down the road, PSI, PSI Net was no longer in business and the state right, they were gone. a new name. Yeah. Yeah. No, the names in those environments, the names typically last as long as the checks keep coming. And then when the checks stop, uh, it's time to get, it's time to find somebody else. So, or the company doesn't exist anymore or is yeah. taken yeah. over by another company. And we were just talking before we went on air, all the names of the San Francisco Giants ballpark in just 21 years the Oakland Coliseum. And I love it when they go through all these corporate names that don't exist. And then they go back to it's the Oakland Coliseum. Like, yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. But Stanley, it's a, it's a 20 year deal for $700 million, $700 million. Yeah. So it's $35 million a year. Right. So obviously yeah. that's a record, right? right? I mean, how, how on earth, are they going How to pay $35 million a year? Are they spending $35 million a year to name a place? I mean, it's guys, it, is it me or is that ridiculous? 
Uh, it's you and you're ridiculous. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I think about um, the, the deal that I was involved in when the Grizzlies moved from Vancouver to Memphis with a company that's probably going to exist for a while called Federal Express. Um, yeah. And uh, actually that deal is coming up in a year or two, but that was 125 million over 20 years. And here we're talking almost a billion, a billion dollars. So doesn't it really smell more like crypto.com is all in to get their brand out there? Yeah. And Lord knows whether yeah. or not they will exist or not, but they yeah. are all in. Marty? Yeah, these, these things, they have a lot in common with shirt sponsorships. You'll see this in the NBA and the NHL. Um, the one thing, there's only one thing that you can guarantee with a stadium naming rights or a, 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 you know, a deal for jerseys or whatever, and that is brand awareness. Everything else is, is suspect. Uh, so if you're you know, moving in that direction, and look, here's where we are, right? We're at the advent of legalized sports betting. So you've seen a rush to that. You now see the normalization, I call it, of cryptocurrency and, and the various types. And so you know, this year in Major League Baseball, FTX, which is a cryptocurrency uh, brand, yep was the right uh, they're on the umpires uh, was on the umpires, the umpires and yep. so it's it's a it's a gold rush at this point so to speak torture the metaphor to get there but again uh as good as the contracts are um it, it will last as long as the checks keep coming uh and it's not uncommon we've already seen it in the nba where some of the original jersey uh sponsorships have already turned over well, let's because let's talk were, about yeah. L.A. a few years ago. I can't remember all the circumstances, but remember when State Farm put their brand on the stadium in L.A. that never was built? Yeah, that's they right. marketed yeah. the heck out of that yeah. for several years. I thought that was the best naming rights deal ever because <laughs> I don't think any money exchanged hands, but all the news reports coming out of L.A. for the stadium were... State Farm, State Farm, State Farm. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, brilliant. And then they slid all that money into spending it with Aaron Rodgers, who has uh, Luke's relationship with the truth. Let's <laughs> let's talk about Aaron Rodgers. Uh, has he significantly damaged his brand, Marty? Uh, you know, my initial reaction is yes, but because it's Aaron Rodgers, I would equivocate on that because, number one, He's accumulated so much money in his, you know, playing career and his endorsement career that I, I frankly don't think he really cares if he does another spot or does something else. And his brand, he's almost like an iconoclast, right? Like he's that guy that goes in the other direction. And so he's not swimming with the rest of the crowd. And so in that regard, I think he might have even enhanced his brand in some respect because, look, he aligned himself with a specific what I call today the third rail of uh, a sort of, you know, healthcare. And he's clearly said, I'm firmly in this camp. So he's put his sponsors in a position, you know, his healthcare sponsor already had to walk away from him. That was not mutual for sure. Yeah. Um, but he's put his other endorsement companies, State Farm and others in a position where the next question from the media is, do you agree? How do you feel about it? How about your employees? And so I suspect that he might take a holiday from some of this for a while and perhaps come back uh, at a later time when things have calmed down, at least on the healthcare front. Well, the brand we all know State Farm as is they're the good neighbor. And do you want a good neighbor that will potentially lie to you right. as a spokesperson? Yeah. Well, well, Stan, he, he may have damaged his reputation now and he may have lost his sponsorship with State Farm. Yeah. That could all be true, but just look at him, okay? He is rebranding himself. Yeah. Two years ago, he was a clean cut, no hair out the helmet, you know, uh, you know, perfect kind of guy, Danica Patrick and all that. Look at him now. He is purposely rebranding himself. I agree. His look, I agree with demeanor, Gary. Um, right. When he so went I with a man bun that told me he was going down a different path. You see him at Halloween parties brandishing, you know, a handgun. Exactly. Oh, that, you know, that makes sense. I think what we're looking at, and Gary, you know, pointed it out. He didn't say it. I'll say it. Is the bananization of brands. Mm. 
where somebody goes, oh yeah, you're that way? Look at me, I'm going 180 completely different mm. and I'll monetize it up the kazoo because I got millions of people who want my view, not your view. Right, so, so, so Stan, j just a final point on that. Um, you know, it, what happened with him and the COVID, you know, he was immunized or whatever word he used, that's yesterday's news already. Now he's on to something else like Andy just pointed out and we'll see the money start flowing to Aaron Rodgers in a different way pretty soon. Interesting, interesting. And yeah, I don't a couple... think, um, am I wrong here that he didn't get his degree from Cal? Did he not complete? I'm, I'm literally, I'm not sure. Just, whether... just based on the know. answers that he gave on that, that podcast, I don't think he has a degree. But I think uh, okay. I just think checking. Wrong. Yeah, I was mainly just talking about, I don't think it's tenable for State Farm to stay with him. I'm no. not saying whether his, his rebranding of himself won't be successful. Well, maybe he'll go to become the Havoc guy because the insurance companies are making a bundle these days. If you watch any TV, insurance company, insurance company, insurance yep. company, um, and the only quality, well, you know, what's quality? I mean, holy mackerel, between all those companies, you don't even know who you're being insured by. While we're while we're on it, and then I do want to definitely get back and talk about baseball because baseball is on the brink of perhaps its first work stoppage in uh, 26 years, I believe it is. But but while we're talking TV, all of us have seen probably too many ads for betting concerns at this point in time. Can we raise our hand if you've seen enough ads offering me? <laughs> Offering me a hundred dollars if a team gets one hit in a game or something like that. Well, I understand that the concept of what they're doing now is customer acquisition. Is there a possibility that nobody, it just seems staggering that, that nobody is trying to educate the players on what terms mean, what, how you bet on sports. Is that something that will come in a phase two, once they have you as a customer, or it's never coming. How much money was bet on the last Super Bowl? Five, bil five, five billion, billion dollars. Five billion. Five billion. Okay. And that, is, that much the money? Is, that crypto, is that cryptocurrency? Or is that <laughs> no, well, let's leave that alone for a second. Yeah. How much money did the MVP of the game get from betting? Zero. Zero. How much money did any of the team owners in the NFL get from betting of that five billion? Zero. Zero. So if you just keep going through it, I think you're absolutely right. Um, how is the equation? I'd turn to Professor Conway there. Um, how does the equation work that sometime in the future, this tremendous waterfall of billions and billions of dollars is going to come back to the people that are playing the games and owning the teams. Yeah, well, I think you, you just saw the NBA renew their deal with Sport Radar and actually take, uh, take a 3% interest in the company. Um, and so I think going forward, um, you're going to see this, you know, in the future where the leagues and obviously represented by their owners and perhaps even in the player association, they're going to demand equity in whatever partnerships that they have because this, like we just talked about, the sponsorship and the advertising is going to come and go. We all remember a few years ago, we had the same conversation about fantasy sports. Fantasy sports it, was, advertising. it was virtually every other ad until the point. And so you say, what happens until the point somebody in Washington raises their hand and says, this looks like too much. Can you come down and talk to us? And at that point, things begin to change. So, but I also think that if you look at this, this is the, you know, I use the phrase again, the gold rush time. This is all about, there are probably 10, 20, maybe more companies involved right now. This is gonna narrow down to five, six or seven companies. There's gonna be an incredible amount of consolidation. I tell you, if you went to the airport in the 1980s to rent a car, there were 24 choices. You go there now, there are five or six and they're owned by the two or three companies that have consolidated them all together. And so that's clearly where we're headed. Whoever has the biggest balance sheet and can last the longest. Will, will be there to acquire. But I agree with you. I think organizations 
are now seeing the, the flip side of this, which is these dangerous boostings where these are virtually guaranteed wins on your first bet. You have to retain those winnings if when you do win, you have to retain them as site credit and continue. You can't even pull your money out until you've betted two or three times. And, and that's where really the danger is, is getting people, because as we know, we all know people who bet sports illegally. All of us individually know somebody. And I, have those people are, I have done it on occasion. And those people are not moving to legalized gambling because with a, with a bookie, you can bet on credit. You can get better odds. There's all sorts of reasons to do it. You move to legalized sports betting. You've got to pay up front. You know what the odds are, all those different things. You have to claim it. And on let's, your let's add in that you're going to be unbelievably regulated by any government organization, local, yeah. regional, state and national because of yeah. this and when i see marty wearing that i i gotta go with stanford <laughs> to elevate so Mike, gary well, and stan is that okay can I, that's fine just, yeah, it's fine with me but listen marty what 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 you were just uh -huh. describing is the same thing that the that the le that the legal cannabis industry is seeing yeah. you know the legal cannabis industry is regulated they only can accept cash Banks yep. can't really deal with them because it's not federally legal yet, only yep. statewide legalities. So therefore, not that I know a lot about it, but therefore a lot of people that smoke marijuana are still buying it illegally because yep. they don't have to deal with all that stuff. And yep. it's less expensive and it's just as good. And so well, I uh, don't know what this means, but I was in Las Vegas <clears throat> last week talking to the Pioneer League owners in minor league baseball. Mm -hmm. And in walking through the casino floor, this always, I just don't get it. The most um, people were sitting in front of penny or nickel slots. Yeah. And I'm going like, what, what can you possibly get out of that? Killing That's time, that. killing uh, time. Yeah, I guess. Out of that. Yeah, and so one, one last point on that, and that is um, somebody mentioned the amount. New York City, New York State just uh, legalized theirs, and they've got now got eight or nine companies. The the take for New York State for betting in the state is fifty one percent. That's what the state brings in. Right. So right. I, I don't see long term how you can have too many companies where fifty one cents out of every dollar that right. bet is going to the state. Um, that that's just a recipe for fewer and fewer companies over time who can afford to do that, who get to scale large enough and can afford to be able to do that. Most states are much less than that, even even 30 or 40 percent in some places. So this is all going to sort itself out and work itself out naturally and organically over the next few years. But it's not going to be pretty. We're going to be deluged with ads and marketing. The Manning family just announced a deal with Caesar Sportsbook to be ambassadors. Like it's the gold rush days and, and it's going to last at least another year or two. And, like and someone is going to get paid off to affect a game. I mean, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. happened in mm -hmm. the history of sports, in every sport, it's going to happen. Yep. You know, people have sort of forgotten the name Tim Donaghy, but it will show its yep. head again someplace. Right. Yep. Well, we just yep. had a Vander Kane investigator for that in the NHL. Right, so, uh, right here in it's, San Jose. It's, yeah, it's in present day for sure. Unbelievable, unbelievable. We're talking with Marty Conway, professor of sports business at Georgetown University, and Andy Dolich, who also teaches sports business at Stanford University. I'm just an instructor, Stan. I'm just an instructor. <laughs> I'm trying to build you up, and you're building yourself down. Hey, He's very self-deprecating. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about this baseball situation right now. Uh, I'm really kind of scratching my head. Noah Syndergaard has pitched two innings mm -hmm. over 2020 and 2021 he just got 21 million dollars to pitch for one year for the los angeles angels which probably curses him for the rest of his career but just about in the last hour it's been announced that justin verlander thanks to marty conway letting me know has signed a one-year deal to go back to the houston astros for 25 million dollars um just what is this work stoppage going to be about uh, come December 2nd, if we in fact have it. Andy? Well, as we've talked about many times, the fluid that flows through the veins of sports is green. Uh, the color 
and it will be a tug of billions or millions between labor and management, which has always shown itself over decades as to who gets what. And you know, what have we talked about here right from the get-go? All forms of money and you know, 700 million for naming rights, 20, 11 and a half million dollars a win. Is that what Noah's number is? <laughs> um, or, oh, uh, Mike Trout. Uh, yeah, what are you being paid? $350 million. The numbers seem silly, but somebody's paying them. So I just think it's, uh, we think it's a little out of balance. So we need to get more back and we don't want you to get as much. But that is insane because you'll always have owners who will give players whatever they want because they can afford it. Marty? Yeah, well, if you look, um, so a couple interesting things. Uh, 14 players were offered the uh, qualifying offer, qualifying like 18 and a half million. 13 of those 14 rejected it, including Verlander and Syndergaard, who both were guaranteed 18 and a half million, but rejected that and got more. Um, I think only one player from the Giants uh, accepted his uh, Brandon Belt. Brandon Belt, John. Yeah. And I'm nominating Buster offer. Posey for a Nobel right. Peace Prize because he walked away <laughs> from, I think, 28 or 30. So yeah. no, I'm fine. I'm done. Exactly. I'm good enough. But the point is, I think you're seeing something interesting here. You're seeing players, uh, Eduardo Rodriguez and Barrios and others, sign during this period, right? which we, I think we all, many of us thought, okay, once this uh, World Series is over, there'll be a lockbox, sort of a freeze. But I think what the players and agents have recognized is last time we had a situation like this, we did get a new CBA, but we had this incredibly condensed free agent period right prior to spring training and money went to certain players and certain players were yeah. left out at the end and get as much. And so this time both players and owners feel so confident in their ability to have a new deal struck in a month or two or whatever it's going to be, that they're almost operating as if business as usual. It's like the, the, I say this, the business of baseball, both for the owners and now the players, they are awash in money. They feel so confident that they're not holding back prior to a new contract. I don't think we've ever seen this before. Those of us have watched baseball business for a long time, we used to see this almost perp walk to the contract end and then a lockout and to do it. So I don't know what's going to happen for me. It's quite simple. They're, they are awash in so much money that that meeting on December 1st or November 30th, whatever they're going to meet should be as simple as this. It should be as simple as going down to the Dolich family auto mall where they have v, VWs and Toyotas and Fords and Mazdas and say, I'm just going to sign and drive because I know I'm going to get a good deal. I'll trade you the DH in one league for another round of playoffs and I'll trade you this for that. And let's get it done because both sides feel incredibly confident. That money. is why he is a professor, professor and I'm an professor. because yeah. he has that gray matter. And I would just posit, I think that's a word, you know, look at major league baseball, making a decision to whack 40 minor league teams. Yeah. The money was mouse meat. There's no reason they needed to do that, but they right. did. Yeah. So even though Marty is incredibly logical, will both parties see it that way? As a that's what I was going to say. As yeah. opposed to injecting them with a new strain of COVID when they should be celebrating coming right. out uh, and looking at a new season. Yeah. Well, yeah, before no, I, I turn that. it over, Good. before I turn it over to Gary to ask a couple of questions along these lines, let me just finish with one one thought here is um, this, this, this potential for a work stoppage. There's nothing in the, the end of a ag basic agreement that calls upon either side to either declare a strike or a lockout. Right. But there's talk that as of 12.01 on December 2nd, 12.01 a.m., the owners will lock out the baseball the MLB players and thereby put a freeze on all the offseason maneuverings. Why is that necessary for the owners to do that, Marty? Well, first of all, once they get to that point, you can only have a strike if you have an agreement in place. So this would be entirely on the owners in terms of a lockout. Okay. But it really comes down to not having your work rules in place. And I think that as much, it's not so much to keep players from not working out or not being at facilities or 
all those types of things. It's about not having the basic work rules in place to know what you can and can't do. And so they essentially have to restrain their own side, the owners okay. themselves, from engaging in business as usual. Now, again, I agree with Andy. I think there's such a lack of common sense. I don't have any confidence that they'll strike an agreement in December. In fact, I think it's entirely possible that they might see their way to delay the kind of lockout. And maybe they push that down the road. They say, we're making progress at the table. We don't need to have a lockout in December, but there is a date. We all know that deadlines spur action. And so there will be a date. I don't know if it'll be in December or February where they're gonna to have to draw the line and say, we don't have this deal by then. Just like the COVID season yep. where Rob Manfred said, we gotta know by this date or else we're not moving forward. So I think and who are you locking wrong. out? You're locking out the fans. Those yeah. are the last people and you're you to lock out that you yeah. want to lock out. You're not locking the player out of his new Lamborghini. You're not locking the owner out of his G7. You're not locking right. somebody else out of their gated community. You're locking out the fans' emotion and caring about baseball when it started to come back and we saw a lot and go, nah, yeah, we're fine. You don't have to see our sport. Well, but, and Andy, not, not only that, but you're not even locking the baseball players out of playing a game because games don't even start until February for right. spring training right. and April for baseball. But, but Andy and, and Marty, that was going to be my point is, I mean, let's take a look at the landscape of baseball over the last couple of seasons and see if this, this uh, strike or lockout or whatever, the news that it would dominate over the next couple of months even makes sense. I mean, you've got a 2020 COVID season, which was ridiculous, and nobody cares about it. And I defy you to even tell me who the World Series champion was that year. I know you well, can. Los Angeles but, Dodgers. Okay, but most people can't because they didn't even watch it. Okay, that's number one. Number two, Marty, I think it was you before, or somebody before said there were six teams this year that didn't even draw a million yes. fans, Andy. Yeah. I mean, that last time that probably happened was the 1960s, which, oh, by the way, was 60 years ago, okay? And, and so, I mean, let's take a look at the landscape here for a minute. You know, I mean, the fans are going to be looking at this and they're going to be going, what, wait, really? Ridiculous? Are you kidding me? We don't even care about your game and you guys are bickering over this stuff. I mean, it's, I just don't understand if and you talk about timing, this is just ridiculous timing for something like this to happen for a sport that is, I wouldn't say it's dying, I, I would, but it's I would not say healthy. that, you know, Scott Boris made a great point last week. And of course, you know, he gets everybody riled up, but when you have any league or any business where the bottom it falls further away from the top, especially in a competitive entity like pro sports, you're screwed. So my Oakland A's right there drew 700,000 people. The Dodgers drew 2.8 million, which would be, you know, six or 700,000 less than they'd normally, but close to 3 million and others under a million that talks about a scary point that the bottom is moving closer to the further abyss and the top, they don't care. And that's horrible for any business, especially a competitive business like pro sports. Yeah. And the, and the players and, and Boris is right. The players are in the middle of it because you've seen the average salary decline over the last three or four years. It was over 4 million. It's three and a half or something like that. You're also seeing players after the age of 28, 29, have a hard time getting anything more than a one-year deal. Play, you know, the analytics uh, a crowd has brought in the idea that we can have all these different bullpen pitchers and all that. So I, I, I do think, but, but on the other hand, let me just say there is another hand. They have renewed all their TV deals for excess 30, 40, 70% increases. They've gotten sponsorship deals. They've gotten sports betting deals like the business itself is well over $10 billion right now. And, but again, as Gary has said, and Andy has said, the people that are watching this are fans, the owners and players aren't watching this. They have their own separate conversations in those rooms. And the fans are having conversations by saying, we're not coming in Baltimore. We're not coming in Pittsburgh. We're not coming in Oakland. You know, we're happy to do something else. And back to what we talked about even before we got on this event, Job one for somebody in Major League Baseball, whether it's Rob Manfred or his chief marketing officer, is to get people into seats in those stadiums. 
forget, forget international games, forget some of these other things. Job one is to get those people into that stadium in some sort of ticketing situation. And I am shocked, continually shocked that they don't see that as their priority number one. And uh, I, I think that they end up where they are. That's what they uh, frankly deserve. I, so, couldn't agree. Stan, I couldn't agree more with you, Marty, on that, that that's job one. Go ahead, uh, Gary. Stan, so let me, yeah, so let me ask Marty a question on that. So if that's the case, Marty, okay, yeah. and you've got to get fans in seats, yeah. you especially have to try to get fans in seats in those six or seven places that are getting less than a million people, right? Yeah. The Orioles have been basically the laughing stock of the league for the last four years. They're not getting any better. Maybe they will with their young guys. I don't know. But they keep picking first in the draft, okay? They don't spend any money. OK, it is there in these conversations that the players and owners are having or will have some kind of salary floor that teams have to abide by and this tanking concept? Uh, I mean, can you just pick number one forever? I mean, are, 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 are yeah. those issues being addressed at all? No, but I, I'm sure they're part of the conversation. I think there's discussion about somewhere. Well, both sides, as I understand it, not to interrupt you, yeah. Marty, but both sides. Yeah are in agreement that the notion that somebody could pick first for more yeah. than two years in a row is okay. going yeah. to end now. Okay, good. Yeah. My yeah. favorite owner in Major League Baseball is John Fisher, uh, who comes from the Gap fortune. He's estimated at about $3 billion. Um, we've okay. talked about this before in terms of a new ballpark, and we'll put that aside, but he constantly says through others, I don't have the money. So there goes Marcus Simeon, who can play as well as anybody who is local in Oakland. Oh, Bob Melvin, maybe one of the most underappreciated managers in baseball. See ya, go to San Diego. Yeah, and Olsen, and I don't even need to get any compensation yeah, for him. Olsen and <laughs> Chapman, Olsen and Chapman are next. They were in the pennant race until three or four weeks before the end of this season. And to your point, Gary, I'm a fan of 700,000, what am I going to do for this coming season when all of my guys are gone? I'm not coming. I'm not right. coming. No. Who's next? So take no, me out to the ball game. Thought, thought 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 anyhow, back, back to that point, like I was saying was, if you look at from a marketing standpoint, um, you know, what the baseball has done is they've essentially franchised out not only the operations of a team, but they've franchised out the marketing. And they've essentially said, you do it in Baltimore the way you want to do it. You do it in San Francisco the way you want to do it. You do it in Miami the way you want to do it. And quite honestly, it's not working because they're doing it. So you don't see, you know, right? You don't see Chick-fil-A or Taco Bell or anybody else say, you know what? No, that guy in Baltimore, he should just do his own marketing. You don't do that. Like you actually generate traffic into those locations so that those operators can then say, fantastic, this is helping us cultivate a new, a new fan base. And exactly. so I, I don't, I have never understood the outsourcing to various franchises of the game because you've seen what's happened. Mm. So Andy's point, not only are the Orioles not drawing, but they've taken a minor league affiliate out of Frederick. In what, mm. in what world does that make sense? Right. To say, you can come see next year's Orioles or two years Orioles here. Now I know you can go to Bowie and you can go to Aberdeen, but there was nothing wrong with going to Frederick and seeing it as well. So I, I, do, I don't, I, I, I view, didn't understand I view, that. Outside. You know, I, I talked about bananization, if that's a word, but now I look at the subway litmus test in the subway commercials, Charles Barkley, Steph Curry, yeah. Serena Williams, Tom Megan Brady, you know, Tom Brady, Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn, Marshawn Lynch and, Marshawn and, Lynch, and right? Draymond Green voiceover. What sport <laughs> is missing in the subway commercials? Yeah. Baseball. Yeah. And so That's I'll, I'll give you an example of how, what, what sport addressed that. Golf recognized that they had this sort of problem. They actually put aside $40 million for the top 10 players socially, and they divided that money, $4 million a person. So Justin Thomas and others, the more active they are on social media, the higher rank. They get that. Again, golf, golf recognized we are losing here on the margins. And so we need to reward our stars for being more engaged. That's a perfect example. Baseball is a wash in money to say, here's a $100 million fund. We're going to actually put these players out into Chevrolets and subways and things like that. We're going to reward them to do that. 
because we know the return to say that Shohei Otani isn't all over United States this year. I mean, to me, it was crazy to say he's coming to Baltimore for two or three games and major league baseball is not running ad campaigns socially, digitally, and on TV to say, come see Shohei Otani, right? If I'm the marketing director for the Orioles, I'm not getting upset about that. I want them to come see my team, but I want them to come. The Japanese population of the Bay Area is very significant, yeah. very significant. The A's, when Shohei, uh, Shohei came here, there was not, to Marty's point, there was not one radio ad, not one TV spot, not one <laughs> outdoor advertising about that. Come on. You don't have to be as smart as Marty Conway who was one of the greatest marketing minds in baseball to figure that out. So Come on. let me get back to, to Marty's point that the game, and it, I posed this question and Andy, you answered it earlier as to what both sides are trying to accomplish here. If the, if the game is a wash in money, who is trying to win the battle and the battle is just over, over what? I don't, I don't think the average fan can understand that at all. I get the fact of what Marty was talking about 10 minutes ago, that there's a squeeze on players, both at the beginning of their careers, allowing them freedom and then shortening their, their lifespan by squeezing them at the end. But other than that, I don't understand what the owners are really trying to accomplish. More of that? Is that what it is, Marty? Uh, well, I think this is the tug of war. And I think if you, you know, in any tug of war, you had that rope, uh, you had that ribbon in the middle. And for the last two or three CBAs, that, that ribbon has been on the owner side. Owner side, no question. Letter, after decades of it being on the player side, right? Un unrivaled free agency, all of that. The owner slowly- And Tony surely... Clark really got his hat handed to him yeah. on the last, the last and, and, negotiation. And, and Bud Selig is that kind of guy. He is, he's a schemer behind the scenes. He, he, he dialed every dial that he could to be able to do that. And I think the players want to bring that ribbon back towards the middle. And I think the owners are going to say, okay, we can talk about that, but we want another round of playoffs. We want some other things that give them more certainty around their cost basis going forward. Because if they get that, then they can go off to the races with marketing opportunities because every dollar they keep over 50%, they get to keep, you know, themselves. So again, these are not these are not the days of free agency and other big issues that that fans could recognize. These are truly inside baseball issues, uh, with the exception of maybe the playoffs and the designated hitter. For the most part, everything else about service time or anything else is, is strictly an inside game. And frankly, I, I don't. If I was on their side, if I was the and on the owners negotiating team, I'd say, hey, we're not even going to talk about that for the public. Like they don't even really need to understand that that's yeah. sausage making and it doesn't help us. when we. And talk in, about it. in real business, money can always be negotiated. Those people that do big deals, they know that money can always be negotiated. As Marty said, it's those terms. Who's got control? Who's giving up? But what's happening here to me is that these two parties, labor and management, are killing the heart and soul of their sport, which is the fan. Fans, yep. yeah. And if you look at the NBA, you look at football powering through COVID, you look at MLS and franchises that are drawing more people than a lot of baseball franchises and growing <laughs> yeah. and having incredible activity. If you just sit there like boxing and horse racing and go, hey, we're going to be in this position forever. The point of history is no, you're not. Right. So yeah. this is a, this is to me, this is a very, very difficult and dangerous time for baseball, even though the money might be there, the hearts and minds and souls of people. Um, I, I think there's not so much. Yeah. Gary, yeah. go ahead. I know you. Yeah. So answer. just real, real quick to Andy's point, an anecdote to kind of prove your point, Andy, my son just moved a couple months ago from Chicago to DC. And he lives in the Navy Yard section where the stadiums are, right? I'm, I'm talking not only about Nationals Park, but also about Audi yes, Field, I, I, which, I'm, I'm, right? Which is the home of the MLS team. There he is. <laughs> so, but the point I'm making is he tells me that although the Nationals draw pretty well, okay, he tells me that there's a greater buzz around the Navy Yard neighborhood when the DC United is home 
as opposed to the Nationals. It's a younger, more vibrant crowd that enjoys the evening, both before and after. And it's really an event. And it's interesting you mentioned that about some MLS teams outdrawing major league teams. It, that's not the case in D.C. The Nationals do outdraw, but the vibe is much more alive and different. It be more woke, as they say. <laughs> be more woke. No question about it. One last question, guys, tonight on our sports uh, sports business uh, symposium. Um 1999, the Pittsburgh Penguins were almost uh, in, in, insolvent oh, right. and uh, extinct. Came, <laughs> extinct. Kaput. And they were probably going to be uh, relocated. Along came Mario Lemieux, longtime player, star player. And he put together a group that bought the team for, I think, $107 million. That's right. It came out yesterday that the uh, Fenway, Fenway Sports Group uh, headed by John Henry and the folks uh, in Boston are very close to an 850 to $900 million purchase of the Penguins. And they own currently, they own the <laughs> Boston Red Sox, Liverpool. Do you have a Liverpool hat? They don't no, own the, the Seattle, Seattle Kraken. They don't own the Kraken, do they? No, no but look at the Kraken. Kraken. People didn't uh, even know what it meant. I love meant. that name. No, the Kraken is a great name. By the way, the, the uh, Capitals will be playing tonight against the Kings, but Sunday night they're playing in Seattle against, against the, Kraken. the Kraken. Yeah, against yeah. the Kraken. Uh, unlike the, Kraken. the Detroit uh, Red Wings, I hope people don't throw Kraken on the ice. That's right. <laughs> I bet if they threw crack on the ice. So uh, just, no, okay. Let's, no, okay. Uh, let's not no, go. But there. the Fenway Sports Group owns the Red Sox, Liverpool of England's Premier League, the Roush uh, Fenway Racing of NASCAR. They own Fenway Park and many other real estate deals. LeBron James is part of them. Uh, th these prices on these franchises, uh, that's a pretty amazing. Hey, turnaround. let's talk about that next time we're together. Okay. The sort of industrialization of sports, mm. right? I mean, you have Elevate, you have Legends, you have Fenway Sports Group. Wouldn't that be a good topic? I mean, that would be a great topic. Be a great topic. Can we also talk about the new USFL starting up in the spring? Did you guys see that? Again? How, how many, how many Again? times do we have to go through this? Again. Mm. Yeah. How many times will we have to see that there's no... There's no, there's no history of any commercially viable football in the professional the level, yep. with, the, with, the, with the exception of the NFL. Of and course. Want, and look, if you look at North America, it's only the NFL or whatever. And fan control. Exactly. Football. Right? Season so two, it's, it's, we're it's not competing with plan. the NFL. We have nothing yeah. to do with the NFL. Guys, you've, yeah. ra you've raised the level of this up. Uh, it's, it's off the charts. <laughs> I'm going to have to get more hats. Clearly. I'm the mad I'm hatter. Going back to get Call me the mad hatter. hatter. i got to find some hats. Call me the yeah. mad hatter. You know, I was listening to Gary talk about the vibe. Uh, and what I was thinking of was the word you used, the bananization yeah. of, of something. <laughs> That's what the bananization of sports is. It's the young vibe that people are trying to catch, this energy. Yeah. Well, That's you could true. look at just, you know, stadium construction. All these private suites are, are moving away so that groups of 60 or 80, the posse, everybody can be in there and they can be on their phones and go, hey, come up to the party deck or, the, yeah. or this lounge. That's what's yeah. happening. That's and what's and happening. And Andy, those facilities are amazing, right? Because essentially... The fan, the people that are in them have their backs to the game. Yeah, they're perfectly yeah. comfortable paying sixty-five dollars a night to have right. their back to the game, so they can talk to their buddies. And when maybe something happens, they'll turn around, look over they'll their shoulder maybe, but five they'll times. The point. They'll be in but the phone, happy the to do phone, that. Bet. They'll be but in when the we, phone trying to bet cryptocurrency. When we when we built Oriole Park at Camden Yards, we obsessed about every seat facing the diamond and centering on the pit on the pitching rubber and all this sort of stuff. And now every renovation says you guys were 180 degrees wrong. You should have all the seats facing out like, <laughs> to do that. And, and so I don't know where that's going to go if people want that to happen. But um, to, to Stan's that's, point that's about, about somebody from Boston coming into buying a team in Pittsburgh, whether Mario Lemieux stays or not, 
that that is almost heresy in most sports. Mm. That would be like somebody from New York coming and buying a team in Philadelphia and saying, hey, I'm just here for the deal. It's like I can imagine people in Pittsburgh where all of the teams wear black and yellow. Like they have their own little enclave in Pittsburgh yep. to now say our principal majority owner is going to be somebody that owns the Red Sox. The Red Sox. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, yeah. How is that good? Almost for, how is that good for us? Right. Guys, I really appreciate the time. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk sports with you. Well, really, really, I really do think the industrialization of sport and if you want to learn something, go to the Stanford Continuing Studies Guide because I'm teaching high-performing teams lessons from the sports world about just what we were talking about. It starts in January. All right. Or could we take it? Can we take it from long distance? You can take it from any corner of the globe. Whoa! Fantastic. Gary and I might sign up together. I'll I call on sure. you and give you the Stanford internal discount. <laughs> You'll give me the right. Rogers rate. I'll give, give you the, the David Rogers. Rubenstein ah, yeah. rate, Stanley. <laughs> right, right. Hey, right. Last, qu- last real quick, <laughs> just a quick thing. Uh, Marty, will baseball start? Will spring training start on time? And will the game start when they were scheduled to start? Um, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I'm, I'm generally pessimistic about those things, but I think there's too much money on both sides to, to delay that further. Those days, I think, are, are over. Uh, of a of a huge lockout strike type situation. Andy, agree I'm agreeing or with my colleague that you can't be that stupid. Stupid. Yeah. yeah. Right. Andy, as I John, just realized. as John McEnroe would say in the yeah. subway or in the, well, I don't know. He's he's with Serena. Like you can't yeah. be serious. You right? can't Andy, be serious. I just realized you've got two A's caps over there. Uh, yeah, well, they paid me the most money over they the longest the period. Okay, of time, okay. So to... Gary, you think there'll be baseball when it's supposed to be? I agree. I think they they can't be that stupid, can they, Stan? Mm, I'm not so sure, but we'll find <laughs> out. Stay tuned. Hey guys, thanks a, thanks a lot for doing this. Always now, a we're pleasure. Take, um, you and I are going to take off next Wednesday because right. of Thanksgiving holiday. We're, we're back with a couple interesting shows after that the next time that that you uh months from now that you have us back on i'll wear a sweatshirt and i'll send marty some hats so we'll (laughs) perfect i I like that idea i like that idea uh we've got an interesting we've got an interesting show coming up december 2nd which is thursday night i couldn't get coach k to agree to come on but his (laughs) assistant ad sid john jackson We'll talk oh, about what a phenomenal ride it's been for Coach K at Duke and uh, just what this last season is going to be like uh, watching that Duke University team. For so Gary good. Stein, Marty Conway, and Andy Dolich, I thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you down the road. Yeah, hey guys, happy Thanksgiving to you happy and to everybody Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Happy, happy. Okay. See, you. see you all.